This week on Non-Native Creative, I'm very happy to welcome Maurice Jones. Originally from Germany, he is now the Artistic and Communications Director for Mutech Japan. If you're not familiar with Mutech, it's a worldwide organization that produces events. They're based around like the intersection of art, science, music, technology. It's very cool. So we talked about this and we also talked about how they curate their lineups as well as what's coming up next for Mutech overall. So I hope that you enjoy this talk and you can find out more information about Maurice and Mutech from the links in the description. Enjoy! On this week's episode of Non-Native Creative, I am very excited to welcome Maurice Jones to the show. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you for having me. He is the Artistic and Communications Director of Mutech Japan. So Mutech is a big media, uh, music, technology event extravaganza, which we are going to hear all about in this discussion today. So thanks very much for taking some time to come and talk to me. I'm very excited. Uh, I want to start this discussion as I start every episode mm -hmm. uh, of this series by asking the a question that I borrow from the X-Men, uh, which is uh, to please share with us your origin story. If there was one experience or one event or one thing uh, that happened to you or that you uh, saw or felt or whatever that kind of got you started along the path that led you to where you are today, what would that be? The origin story. Yeah, the, what is the, it? the path that led me to like doing Mutech Japan or like way before? Uh, I would say maybe let's go with the the origin story that brought you to perhaps Japan in the first the first time. Uh, to Japan the first time. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, my mother is a flight attendant, so when we were younger, we we were always traveling a lot. And mm -hmm. um, one time was actually over New Year's to to Tokyo, and um, at the time they were flying to Narita. Um, so they were staying at Makohari Mesa. Okay. And uh, it was New Year's Eve and it was completely empty and it was really fascinating because, I mean, Makohari Mesa is huge. Uh -huh. It's like this industrial kind of area, but it's New Year's Eve, so no one's there. And it was like very surreal to be in this like very foreign place and it's just empty. There's no one. Okay. There's like one kaiten sushi that was open where we went to eat and okay. that was about it. Um, I'm not sure if that was the time where I decided to come to Japan, but uh, I thought about it a few times afterwards. That definitely left an impression. Mm. How um, old were you, did you say, at that um, time? At the time, I was maybe like nine or ten. Okay, so you're kind of old enough for that to really be like, oh, this is something kind of special and interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. for sure. Okay, so that kind of had this, like, you had sort of this image of Japan in your head from this experience in yeah. Makahari Mese then. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, you know, you became older and I guess you held on to that, that kind of image of Japan or like that desire to return? Um, I had the image in my head, but uh, to be honest, I actually never planned to like move to Japan, but uh, there was always like an affinity to like Asia after like high school, I went traveling in Southeast Asia for like a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and then eventually I started studying and um, I chose Japanese because I thought it was like an, an interesting and cool language uh, to learn. Um, and then I had the opportunity to study here and that was like, it was for, it was supposed to only be a year, mm -hmm. but that was the time where it like really dawned on me that actually this could be a place where I could oh. spend some, some more time in the future. So right. it was not something that like, okay, this experience happened when I was a child and it made me come to Japan, mm -hmm. but maybe it was like subconsciously, I don't know. Could be, <laughs> I know, it's hard like kind of to pinpoint these yeah. things. And then sort of just to backtrack a bit, your home country is Germany, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So did you have like a, a school program that you were able to come, like to do like the study abroad experience, the language study experience? Yeah, exactly. So okay. I was studying uh, at the University of Bonn, mm -hmm. um, like uh, actually Asian cultures and politics <laughs> at the time. Okay. And we had to choose a language. Um, and at the time, I actually just thought like Japanese is a cool language, it's quite useful as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I chose it, and then I got the opportunity. I actually lived in Taiwan for one year before I came to Japan. Okay. Um, so I did like a double exchange. That's not very usual. Yeah, but that's interesting. But when I got it offered, um, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Cool. <laughs> I had a great time in Taiwan, why not go to Japan? Ah, all right, all right. But then eventually, I like I assume, you decided at some point you preferred Japan more and decided to move here. Yeah, I mean, like I was studying here for one year, actually in Shizuoka, which was like very nice. I was seeing Mount Fuji every morning. Mm -hmm. um, and then I came here to, to work um, for the German Chamber of Commerce okay. um, as a business consultant. So okay. very different from what I'm doing now. Yeah. Um, and then I fell in love with Tokyo 
during the time living here and mm -hmm. working here and then like it's been almost eight years <laughs> really really wow so yeah i that's okay that's a, probably my next question in the series of like how you made the jump from business consultant at the german chamber of commerce to doing the, the role that you're doing now but uh if you could if I know this is a really hard question. It's, I hate it when people ask me this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. What, can you maybe share a little bit about any like examples of something that may, really made you enjoy the experience of living in Tokyo, like that made you fall in love with it? Um, I think it's probably. I mean, I'm really interested in the in the cultural in the underground culture in in Japan, and okay. I think especially in Tokyo, it's so vast. Um, there's like so many different places, so many different people that do like small scale things for like only their friends, 30, 40 people mm. at a time. But there's so much going on. Like every time I'm going out and like I'm, I'm finding something new mm -hmm. and like I'm blown away that this exists. And this is kind of representative for me about something that I love about Japan in general is that it's like it's all in the details kind of. Uh, I, s I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Like if you look down on Tokyo, you might just see like, OK, this big concrete thing. But mm. then. Um, when I'm riding my bike to work, for example, I feel like I ride the same way every day, but every day I see something new, like mm -hmm. a little detail, like some, I don't know, flower arrangement or something that you didn't notice before. But these are the kind of details that fascinated me mm. about Tokyo so much. And um, I mean, of course, it's probably in other cities as well, but especially here, I think it's a very, yeah, very big thing. That's a very common topic that uh, a lot of people mention uh, when they talk about Tokyo. It's like this kind of, there's such like a strong niche culture, like subculture within subculture. Yeah. Like whatever your thing is, you could probably find someone who's interested yeah. in doing that here. Yeah. yeah, so that's really cool. Okay, so then to go back to the other question that uh, I mentioned earlier then, how did you make the leap from, uh, from your Chamber of Commerce job to the role that you're in now they seem like very different positions maybe yeah not. so the like we've always been doing like uh, parties and events um while i was in tokyo mm -hmm. um mostly like around shibuya like womb club um we've been doing quite a few things uh, in the past mm -hmm. um but there was a time when like in 2013 14 like the underground electronic music scene, it was actually getting a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Like uh, like a lot of clubs were closing at the time, a lot of events were like shutting down. And it um, it became worrying for us because that was the kind of ecosystem that we, we were working in. <clears throat> and then business consultancy was all right. I mean, the money was pretty good. <laughs> But, um, but it's not what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to embrace that cultural side a lot more. Okay. Um, and then when we saw that the, um, like the scene is kind of shrinking, um, we're thinking about something to do. Um, and one idea was to do a festival. Mm -hmm. um, but also like doing it to... I mean, Mutech is a lot more than just like an electronic music festival. I think maybe we're going to talk about that yes. <laughs> in a little bit. Mm. But um, but basically, that was it. Like we've all be always been doing events, then business consultancy got boring, and then we started the the festival to kind of okay uh, help the scene to some extent. Yeah, because that's a topic. That's another topic. It's just like in general, the underground music scene in Japan is very different. I think from say the underground scene in the, like in the UK and, and throughout Europe yeah. and as well in the USA, it's like a very different vibe, uh, very different impressions people have of um, underground music and club culture and so on, which is uh, putting pressure on artists and event planners yeah. and organizers and so on. So uh, then, yes, as you mentioned, then maybe we can explain a little bit more about what Mutech even is, because this this is we're talking specifically about the Japan Mutech yeah. in this case, but Mutech is a much larger beast, right? Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So Mutech, um, like the core thing, is a festival, but I would always like to describe it more as a concept or an approach to to doing things. So originally it's from Montreal. It's been there for 20 years, um, actually 21 years this year. Um, and then in a few other cities around the world, including uh, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, um, Barcelona, Dubai, San Francisco, and Japan. Mm -hmm. So seven cities cool. by now. So it's kind of like an international network of, of festivals. But um, um, like each, like originally Montreal never thought about expanding the festival mm -hmm. um, but people from other scenes around the world they were seeing okay this is a great concept that 
works at the intersection of art and music and science and technology and it's not just a showcase of like DJs but actually something that is more substantial mm -hmm. and kind of uh, working on asking actually quite big questions like how, how are we as humans going to live with technology mm -hmm. in the future and what role does music and art play in there mm -hmm. and um, so people from different scenes around the world originally like the first one was from Mexico City um, thought that this is a great concept and it's actually like very innovative and very important to talk about these things mm -hmm. in this kind of artistic and musical context and then like I said Montreal never thought to to expand but um, but then they actually didn't and um, I think the important thing also with Japan is always to say that it's like a homegrown thing like it's sometimes people think okay this is this international festival mm. brand I don't know, like EDC or Ultra right. or something. That was the first thing that came to my mind as yeah. EDC, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this very, like, international, very, like, Western, maybe, approach. Yeah. It's, like, to plop it into Japan is a very different thing yeah. than saying growing it here. Yeah, it's very different. I mean, it also has it, its place. Like, um, that's also, right? But um, we have, like, a very different approach. We really, I mean, we've always been doing events here. And we've been trying to do something that is meaningful to, to, to the local environment. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of... Also, the beautiful thing about the concept, it's like it's fixed enough in like what we try to achieve that we kind of have a guideline of how to th do things. But it's open enough to really adjust it to like what makes sense in the local environment. OK, I see. So Mutek in Mexico, maybe on the outside, might look very different from what we do in Japan. Mm. But the spirit and the, the atmosphere and the kind of thoughts behind it is quite similar. And that's quite the nice thing about it I okay cool and like some other there are some other things that are kind of unique and interesting about it like uh, when you talk about like a, a music related festival or like kind of an artistic festival I think many people have this image of it being in like this huge party zone or maybe in like a club or something like that but uh, recent in recent years Mutech is not held in in a club like in Shibuya anymore it's held in a museum right yeah, or actually, the events held yeah, in we museum. had two years in Miraikan, the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, mm -hmm. in in uh, Odaiba. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's also something we try to kind of break open the the context of the of the normal idea of a festival. It's in a club where it's like outside on a mountain, but really like going to spaces that you wouldn't necessarily expect this kind of uh, festival to happen. So mm -hmm. last year in December. We actually did it in Shibuya, but we had a um, different kind of venue, so we didn't do it at like Womb or this kind of club uh, environment. We mm -hmm. had, for example, a big theater in uh, Line Cube Shibuya, which just opened like a few months ago. Okay. So it's a 2,000 people seated kind of theater where you usually have operas and theaters. And we brought like lasers and <laughs> interesting <laughs> dancers and visuals and smoke and all these kind of things. Uh -huh. So always trying to like invade new spaces and like use them in in ways that they weren't initially kind of intended to do that okay so if i'm if i'm a person that's uh i'm for i'm gonna come to japan or whatever and i find that there's a mutech event that's gonna go on while i'm yeah. there like what can i expect if i attend what am i gonna see um our program is like very diverse mm -hmm. which is which can be quite quite confusing sometimes for people that are new to the thing um, but yeah we really put a lot of um, emphasis on the intersection of like the audio and the visual um, so you're gonna see like um, huge screens with like amazing visuals with experimental music um, is probably one of the the main trademarks mm -hmm. if you want to like have the most obvious but then we we Go a little deeper than that. It's not just visuals and music, but we have a lot of artists that work with new technologies. Like um, last year, we had a big focus on artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and how to make music and visuals with that. Um, we actually have like a big VR section. Um, we also have like more like socially focused topics. We had a collaboration with them um, with a collective or party series called Waifu. I'm not sure if you heard the about the name them. I've seen. I feel like I've seen flyers here and there over the years. Yeah, you yeah. probably. They've been running it since a year. Um, very great people, kind of um, promoting a more inclusive, um, like nighttime ex nightlife experiences, mm -hmm. uh, more diversity, and creating safer spaces for people. Mm -hmm. um, so we also kind of focus on these topics, and we want to give people a space to actually be be able to openly discuss mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. Um, because sometimes in Japan it can be that 
some of these discussions are there's no space for them mm. or it can be seen as like meiwaku or something right, in yeah. that direction. And yeah. we really want to create this safer space where we actually can have these discussions. Um, I right. guess that maybe comes more from my side because I'm the only like foreigner in the team. Oh, really? <laughs> but um, but I'm very grateful to like uh, the rest of the team that they actually let me let me do that because I think mm-hmm. it's a very important kind of thing to to give people the chance to talk about things. Right. Yeah. And that's and I think that that's uh, the concept of discussion. Actually, this is something else that that has come up a couple times in uh, in this interview series. Actually, is uh, something that. Uh, uh, non-Japanese people often cite as uh, some as, as a challenge of uh, participating in Japanese working culture and in Japanese society is that the notion of discussion as a tool f- to make progress or as a tool to find solutions is kind of n- not prioritized or it's not preferred. Like you use the word meiwaku, which means like annoying or bothersome or troublesome in English. And people, uh, some people kind of shy away from discussing topics that uh, could be like a little bit uncomfortable in some way yeah Mm. so how what's been kind of the response then because to my understanding there have been some parts of the mutech program that integrate discussion opportunities right like kind of panel discussions yeah we have um actually i would say half of our program is actually like panel discussions Mm. and presentations and oftentimes they're more focused on like music and um like music production or like hearing from artists directly Mm -hmm and uh, workshops and these kind of things. But um, we also try to integrate more of this kind of social discussions Mm -hmm. um, because we think it's important. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the reaction, it's actually been quite positive because it's actually in the end, the the discussion and the arguments are not like that aggressive in the end. Like people maybe feel at the beginning, it might be something that could be uncomfortable. Like Mm -hmm. the thought about having this discussion Mm -hmm. actually seems more uncomfortable than the discussion in the end uh, might actually be. I see. So like more that fear of like confrontation that that could be be annoying. But mm-hmm. then in the end, you have the discussion and actually once people warm up, it's actually quite fruitful. OK, so, so it becomes like a civil opportunity for discourse. It's not like, yeah. you know, people are shouting or walking out of the room because they feel no, uncomfortable or something. Not at all. Mm, mm. That's really so it sounds like it's a fairly like productive environment then to address some issues that are maybe not commonly covered in uh, in other, you know Yeah, for uh, sure. Places and, in Japan. And yeah, we, we do that by discussing but also also by like just making statements, for example. Like over the the last two years we put a lot of emphasis on getting like a more um, like balanced lineup in terms of diversity. Mm-hmm. So like last year we almost had 50, 50 um, representation of male and female artists in the, in the festival, mm-hmm. wow. which um, is relatively unique mm-hmm. in Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, at the beginning, when we told people that that's something that we're thinking about, because actually the idea com- came from Montreal, they put a lot of emphasis on that. Mm-hmm. We're like, okay, that's something that we should also uh, think about. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the beginning, when we told people, OK, this is something we care about, some people didn't even understand what we mean. Oh, you know? OK. They were like, OK, why is that something important? Shouldn't be the curation or like the musical styles or something more important? This is like, this is I've heard a similar, yeah, similar kind of yeah. question or similar response to that. Like music should come first or something. Exactly. Mm. But um, but I think that's a lazy argument because like that basically says that there are not as many good like female artists as there are male artists. And that's just not true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like um, you just have to make an effort to actually like think about it and find them. And what we've been seeing now that we actually have a more equal lineup, like people love the music and actually people notice like, wow, this year there's like a lot of female artists in the lands. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, sure. And it was good. <laughs> of course it was good. You right. Know? Like right. And I think that another layer to the uh, that initial that initial reaction of like it does like because I, I, I see that per- that person's perspective, that that argument's perspective that like, oh, we'll just put the music first and then it doesn't matter if they're men or women. Like I understand that argument, but like the <clears> issue <throat> comes in when it's like 
if if I'm like you know a young artist and I'm thinking about you know pursuing a, a music or a visual career or something like that, but I don't see anybody who looks like me like to look up to. Like yeah. if I feel like the barrier is much much higher uh, when I there's like not kind of representation that I can relate to. You know, so having you know having a lineup that includes many different kinds of faces yeah. and experiences, I think it, it encourages even more participation, and then you get more different you know perspectives in the artistic scene. So everybody wins. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And that's what we're trying to do. Mm, so I think that that's great. That's awesome. Um, so the Mutech event is, w- would it uh, be fair to say that you have like a couple of like main events each year and then a series of maybe smaller events? Yeah. So we have like one one main event, which is the festival, mm-hmm. which uh, now is five days long. Wow. Um, in December each year. So mm-hmm. the next one is going to be in December 2020. I can't say the dates yet because we re- didn't release them, but it's about <laughs> the same time as it was last year, so you all know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and then we do um, a few events throughout the year. Like actually, next week on the twentieth of February, we do a collaboration event with the French Cultural Institute mm-hmm. at WWW, also showing audiovisual shows and uh, music. Um, so that's going to happen, and then we collaborate with the Japan Media Arts Festival since uh, last year so they have like two weeks of festival and we host like the first weekend of um, performances Mm -hmm. and talk sessions which is actually at Midaikan as well but that's going to be in September now Um, and then we do like a few other small events like uh, workshops and like talks and collaborations and Mm -hmm. these kind of things so we're quite busy yeah I was gonna (laughs) say that's a lot of like uh, a lot of planning that goes into and especially like with collaborative events as well yeah there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so if uh, I, I want to go back a little bit, we started talking a little bit about maybe some of the challenges of, of yeah. working and especially doing this kind of work in Japan. But on the flip side, then, is there anything that you found that you feel like is really joyful or really exciting about working in Japan in your role? Um, I mean, that's also something I think it's general. Um, it's, again, the attention to details when you work with artists. It's incredible how much thought and how much care goes into into the artwork and into the music and uh, into the collaborations mm-hmm. it's um it's really great sometimes it can be also challenging because <laughs> some of the artists might be too perfectionist uh. i had like artists reject playing at the festival because they were saying okay I won't be able to be ready by the time to deliver something that's like high quality enough oh, to wow. perform at the festival which coming from europe is like if, if you're an artist and someone offers you to play at a festival, everyone would be like, yeah, sure. I don't know if I'm going to be ready. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I can play at the festival, you know. So it's quite quite interesting, like a very different uh, mentality and attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes, um, I mean, sometimes they're like very like hard about it. They're like, no, I'm not going to play. And mm. then sometimes, you know, like it also like helps to encourage and just be like no i believe in you i think mm-hmm. you can be ready because i've seen your work mm-hmm. so don't worry and also we we try to provide a space that is um where you can experiment as well mm-hmm. so we have like a lot of commissions per year like a lot of premieres where we actually don't know what is coming out of the of the people's work that they're doing well, that's interesting um but we want to create this safe space where it's like it's okay you can experiment and if you fail it's fine you Mm -hmm. know it's like there have been a lot of shitty performances in the world as well (laughs) (laughs) there's no right answer kind of thing exactly so Mm -hmm. um so yeah and that's something also that um is quite curious that sometimes the idea of experimentation is something that's also a little foreign to 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 some japanese people Mm -hmm where like it's okay to fail like failure is actually part of the process uh-huh. which is i guess more like a western kind of uh, uh, mentality i could see that mm. in some ways um but then if you think about the the broken plates and you fix them with gold mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if it's only western either um but yeah we try to create that safe space for for experimentation cool so as a result you kind of get something that's totally new in some cases exactly. e- every time mm, exactly so something's we have a lot of things that have never been seen or done before so right that's also quite exciting and that's also something that we try to to educate our audience and i think by now it's growing that people trust us now with mm-hmm. the curation of the of the festival that most of our artists like they're not big and famous mm. like of course we have a few headliners but in general it's like people from the underground people that do interesting things 
that we think deserve like a bigger stage to to perform and present their work mm -hmm. and um yeah so that's what we're trying to do <laughs> so maybe and this is maybe getting into a little bit of the detailed uh, aspects yeah. of, of how it all comes together what's the process like of, of curating the lineups each time then like how do you how do you decide like yeah let's approach this artist i mean you talked a bit about like diversity and inclusion and creating yeah. uh, lineups <coughs> with that in mind but in terms of like a and like an artistic sense or something is there something is there something that you look for in the artist you choose um it's quite actually like a like a quite complex process because many things go go into that of course there's the question of diversity as you mentioned mm -hmm. then um, there's the question of international artists we have a strong relation to like the mutate network so there's always like some canadian artists or uh. some mexican artists we try to represent then there's the idea that we actually want to connect closer to the countries around japan mm -hmm. Um, so, like presenting Korean artists or Taiwanese artists and doing collaborations there as well. Oh, cool! So that's one big thing. So there's a um, there's a lot of different factors. Um, by now, actually, we have a lot of artists that approach us from the from the local scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get tons of emails all the time from mm -hmm. just some um, artists that want to perform. Yeah. Um, but we also get like a lot of people that know us by now and they know us personally and they, they contact us and it's like, hey, we have this new kind of interesting project. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in that? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we go out to, to artists and tell them that they should do something new. Okay. Or we like try to pair, I don't know, a visual artist with a musician and just like, we ah. think that you two would be great together. Like Maybe suggesting collaborations. Exactly. Oh, okay. And sometimes we work like very concretely on, on like commissioning and producing our own projects. Like last year we produced a collaboration between Intercity Express, which is a Japanese musician, and Push One Stop, which is a Canadian um, visual artist. So we actively encouraged them and not only put them together, but actually like provided space and provided time for them mm -hmm. to actually produce a new new artwork so there's there's many facets into that go into the creation of the of the program wow. it's quite exciting wow so i'm just out of curiosity how big is the team that's working on putting all this together just for the japan side it's about three and a half three and a half <laughs> uh, three and a half people that's it wow you must be very busy then i imagine it's, it's quite busy that yeah. seems like a lot of work to put yeah. together i mean we have like a like an extended team of like freelancers like oh. know, copywriters editors translators mm. social media managers and these kind of things but mm -hmm. the core team that is like basically producing organizing curating mm -hmm. all these things mm -hmm. it's like Three and a half. <laughs> I see. So, how did you uh, backtracking a little bit uh, in the timeline? Then, how how did you you know get connected with your your the people who are now your team members, the other two and a half people on your team? How did you form that connection? Um, actually, that's a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to share. Um, so my younger sister, she was um, she was dating a, a quite famous DJ at the time, mm -hmm. um, who happened to travel to Japan. Um, and at the time, um, I was still living in Shizuoka, studying, mm -hmm. but I came to Tokyo to to meet her mm -hmm. and like hang out with uh, with her boyfriend mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a gig at Womb. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, like the the other people that are working in the team there, like were organizing the event, mm -hmm. and that's how I got connected with them. Mm, okay. And then we just stayed friends, or we became friends, and um, started like doing stuff together. And that's. That's how it came about. And over time, <laughs> it blossomed into like becoming kind of the, the Japan arm of the Mutech family, yeah. I guess. Yeah, mm. exactly. Wow. So it was just kind of a chance meeting. Yeah, it was actually like one one night, I think, or one moment that changed my whole life. Oh, basically. wow. <laughs> oh, wow. That's and it happened to be through my sister. Oh, my gosh. OK, so there's your there's your Mutech origin story. Then we've got that. <laughs> basically, <laughs> so. yeah. If you think about it, that that's the Mutech origin. Wow. The Mutech Japan origin story. That's really yeah. cool. So are your are your fellow teammates are they also some people from other countries or are they Japanese? Um one half Japanese, half Spanish person mm -hmm. and the other two are Japanese. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. So you have kind of this this group of people that's able to tackle I imagine issues from a series of different perspectives and kind of play in each other's yeah, strengths. Yeah, I think that's really really our strength that we have um that we really transcend like the 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 local and international and can really look at things from different perspectives mm -hmm. and um I don't know, like with the with the gender parity um, question that we just talked about, mm -hmm. it's good to 
like I maybe have the more foreign view, but then we think about, okay, how can we package it in a way that it makes sense to actually address to like our audience mm -hmm. and the people that we want to kind of uh, influence. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's definitely okay. um, our strength in the team for sure. Okay. So would you say then that the, uh, obviously the main focus of what you're working on is, is event based. So very like, you know, uh, person to person, like you're having an experience there. Yeah. But does uh, does Mutech <laughs> do any um, like promotion of these of these ideas or promotion of its work uh, digitally? Is there a lot of uh, is there a lot of um, information that's available online for people to take a look at or to, like to discuss these topics online? Um, we don't really have a, like a discussion platform online. Of course, we have like our social media channels mm -hmm. um, that you can check out on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Um, online, we don't. It's not like we have a forum online. There are some discussions that are happening, like on the social media channels. Um, but that's actually something that we should look into in how to, like, instead of just having this one-off kind of event and have the space for discussion, how to be able to to keep on keep on leading that discussion in mm -hmm. a, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. I see. So I see. Um, yeah, that's another top. Well, maybe another topic. Something very future, future to be yeah, considering yeah, yeah, then. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe we could talk a little bit. I mean, I've I've never been. I don't think I've been to a, a Mutech event uh, specifically, but I think I attended one event uh, that I believe was uh, like a collaborative effort. Uh, it were it was a few DJs or VJs rather that they uh, were performing in a uh, a car showroom down in Yokohama. Uh, no, that was the uh, Nissan Gallery. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, in that's an that was kind of an example. Like I heard about that event, I think through social media somehow, and I thought, okay, well, this sounds kind of strange. I'll go and check this <laughs> out. But what's what's? I mean, that seems like a very unique collaboration to have uh, this very like I suppose new media performance in the middle of a car showroom gallery and like to give some background on this like when when I walked up to the the space where the performance was happening the gallery is just uh, is like three stories tall and there's just glass windows yeah. and as I approached I could see this giant screen that was playing you know whatever the VJ had on at the time and you could see it it was uh, like reflecting out over the bay and it was very like striking is something I the combination of like car showroom and like VJ <laughs> performance was very like you know very surprising but like also it kind of drew me in it made me think yeah i'm going to that like i want to go and see yeah. what that is but like what's what's the kind of thinking behind a collaboration like that so what happened over the the past year or two is that um i mean we have a lot of visuals at our event so it's quite impressive mm -hmm. um so we started getting approached by uh, different kind of brands that um, that wanted to work with us. Okay. Um, to kind of activate their brand. Um, sometimes it's like really a collaboration where like we put the Mutec brand on on the kind of experience that we deliver. Mm -hmm. Like at the Nissan Gallery, mm -hmm. it made a lot of sense because it was live performance, especially. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was in the context of they were launching their Formula E participation. So also like kind of futuristic with mm -hmm. uh, like electric vehicles, uh, environmentally friendly, sustainability. So it kind of made sense for us to put that. I see. Um, and then like, I don't know, we did a big installation for Porsche when they also had an electric vehicle that were <laughs> they were releasing mm -hmm. in, in November. We had like 720 lasers around like the car, which was really cool. Um, we had an installation with uh, Canada Goose. So that's actually something that <clears throat> helps us um, like run the festival itself mm -hmm. because like the festival costs a lot of money. Right. <laughs> and doing this kind of pr pr uh, commercial projects actually helps us uh, fund parts of the festival, okay. have like the cash flow to do things, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, and it's quite exciting work. Actually, right now we did, um, it just ended on Friday. We had a big installation at... Uh, Haneda International Airport mm -hmm. with uh, Bunkacho, with the Japanese agent, the Japan Agency for Culture. Oh, what kind of? It was also like four different, four different artists that did like some video works, also some laser works, um, and it was supposed to like greet the people at uh, Haneda Airport when they were arriving. Wow. Sadly, there was the coronavirus, so maybe not as many people oh, arrived. That's too but bad. Um, but still, we had a few thousand people coming, so wow, that that's was quite exciting. That must have been quite a different experience to come to Haneda and see not like the very traditional like "Welcome to Japan," you know, Mount <laughs> Fuji, like Sakura imagery, but yeah, instead yeah. they were greeted by lasers. 
pretty much. Did you get any, did you have a chance to like go and see like people's reaction at all to that? Um, Yeah, I actually went when I arrived last week. So (laughs) I arrived in Haneda and then I saw the installation and Uh there were like quite a few people and um, I think also a lot of people, they just travel to Haneda too. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Like local people travel to Haneda to actually see the installation there. Uh, Ah, okay. Like, unfortunately, we don't have the data on, like, how many people were actually travelers and how many people were, like, local people that mm. just went to check it out. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's something else. And I think that's that's what the Agency for Culture wanted to go for, basically. Actually, I'm kind of, uh, like, uh, I'm surprised, like, pleasantly surprised, actually, that, that uh, you know these like very official agencies you know like you just described the yeah. agency for culture or like you know also very large brands are taking are taking notice of the ways that you know that people are now getting interested in interacting with music and tech yeah. uh that are <clears throat> kind of maybe different from the ways that um i would i would say mainstream japanese entertainment companies approach it like yeah. it's very mainstream when i say mainstream japanese entertainment companies i mean you know places that are churning out like idol groups for example yeah, yeah. or um you know places that are like curating you know media resources but they're kind of more i guess traditional like you know producing like magazines or other you know very familiar publications but i think it's really interesting that these official organizations are are recognizing the uniqueness uh, and like the kind of eye catchingness and like the strikingness yeah. of you know of this new approach that is coming from somewhere outside of Japan and they're integrating that here. That's really interesting to me. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I think with the with the new technologies, I mean, for brands especially, it's interesting because you can create more unique experiences, um, especially if it's like interactive. It's like really meaningful mm-hmm. to to like a person because people can like almost take ownership for like okay this kind of thing was mine because i interacted with it and then it did something Mm -hmm. and this is kind of like like you take ownership and then it's a lot more meaningful than like just going to a concert and then it's kind of like the traditional like frontal kind of approach of just like i show you something and you consume Mm -hmm. something right and i think that's something that is going to get more and more Mm -hmm. um in the future where like it becomes very like adaptive to the individual kind of person that goes something in through that it becomes meaningful of course it also is flashy <laughs> and looks great on right, instagram right i think that's um, it but i think that's really why people um like enjoy it that much and that's um, why brand us brands are so interested in it because brands want like the people to have like a meaningful experiences with yeah because then i mean well that, product, they, so. it kind of goes down into like a separate rabbit hole but yeah those brands you know when people have that meaningful experience that's also visually very appealing you know yeah. they want to share about that you know yeah. share pictures online or share pictures with their friends or whatever thereby spreading the brand's message yeah. and so on um i wa- i had a i thought of a question uh kind of related to this sort of you know flashy interactive mm-hmm. experience do people compare mutech to say like the team lab experience at all because team lab which team lab is doing you know also exploring art and design and interactivity and they're creating like these you know museum type experiences which are deeply interactive uh and also very you know unique and flashy and so on like do people ever compare mutech with with uh something like team lab yeah of course i mean there's definitely like a strong kind of intersection i mean they're like artists that work for team lab that actually present at the festival so there's that kind of connection and Mm -hmm. of course um for for audience especially like new audiences um it can look quite quite similar Mm -hmm. um but i think um once people get deeper into it they also see the differences Mm -hmm. in in what we're trying to do and what team lab is trying to do um like team lab is definitely like more commercially focused i mean it's it's their main kind of business to to do these kind of things um, where we like we're a cultural association, so we're not like a kabushiki geisha or something. So it's uh, more like non-profit company, yeah. mm-hmm. non-profit um, um, kind of um, goals that we're trying to to go. And it's just like different ways to to approach like these new technologies and what to do with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's definitely a lot of exchange. Like rhizomatics research, for example, is another one um, that we're quite close to. Like Daito Manabe performed at the festival like three or four times already. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important to see that we're kind of working in the same field and that we're just like doing things in like 
a little different way mm -hmm. and that's all right like there's nothing wrong with doing it like mm. one way or the other way i see okay then uh as we kind of get towards the end of our discussion yeah. a little bit i want to try to like turn the topic we've been talking mostly about uh like your experiences and your work uh, with your yeah. projects here in japan but is there anything that you've like kind of taken back to germany or anything that you've kind of wished uh, as you're working there like oh i wish we could do things this way or is there any kind of like sensibility that you've gained through your experiences here mm, i'm definitely more patient than i used to be <laughs> maybe that's also because i'm getting older <laughs> But um, but Japan actually taught me a lot a lot of patience, and mm. I think that's something that's like very uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. um, like in Germany, we're very direct, and like we want to like get stuff done, and like it's very like straightforward and efficient, which I also love for its like own reasons. Right. Um, but yeah, this kind of like thoughtfulness and patience and like detail orientation, which can sometimes get lost if you're like too straightforward mm -hmm. and like just focus on getting things done mm -hmm. so that's definitely something that um that i'm going to take with me for the rest of my life wherever right. i'm going right um and i think that everyone can like benefit from for sure yeah that's something but i think you're right that in in like in western countries where that kind of like very direct communication yeah. style and the efficiency is kind of what we're brought up with and what yeah. we understand to be the best way to move forward it can often be really frustrating for people to come to japan and be like oh yeah it was oh my so gosh. frustrating so like you know everything there's a process for everything and you got to do everything in, in like just the right order and you got to talk to just the right people and this is just the way that it is so you have to wait you know yeah. and that can be very frustrating and i think that, that can like be very that can be something that like makes a person really really like upset sometimes yeah, in yeah. their job or in like even in their personal life here yeah, you know yeah. So patience, yeah, that's something I think I've learned too. That's a good one. That's a good one. Okay, uh, well, we only have a couple minutes left, but yeah. um, if somebody wants to find out more about you or about Mutech or yeah. about all of the projects that you've just described, where yeah. can they find that? Um, Mutech .jp. Okay. Basically, our name is also our website address. Okay. So that's our main communication. You can find us on. Facebook, mutech.jp, mm -hmm. okay. same thing. <laughs> Instagram, same thing. Mutech. Twitter, the JP. same thing. Okay. Um, I think, like, Instagram and Facebook is probably the most interesting. Like, um, Facebook has all the infos on all the events. Instagram has a lot of pretty pictures of the stuff that we do. Yeah. Um, personally, I'm on Instagram, mauricej.studio. Um, but it's not very interesting. Okay. So. <laughs> so, so we should we should follow we should follow the Mutech channels to get all it's the updates about. Definitely the more event. interesting than my Instagram channel. <laughs> but if anybody <laughs> wants to know where to find Maurice, that is yeah. where we can do it. Okay. Uh, then maybe I'd like to close. We can if there's anything that's coming up that you're like super excited to share about, or if you have any burning comments to end to end with. Um, I mean, we have our show on the 20th of February. I mm -hmm. think this is coming out before that. This will come out just a few days before yeah, that. Yeah, perfect. So, if you're in so town, come to our show. You got something to do on Buy Thursday. our tickets. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's going to be exciting. If you, like, it's... It's not the full festival experience, but I think for people, if they want to have like kind of an idea what we what okay. we're doing, it's um it's a good start. It's a nice introduction yeah. then. Yeah, mm, and it's then... like uh, www 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 Shibuya yeah. three W. Yeah, that's the name <laughs> of a venue in Shibuya is yeah. www. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So and you can find more about uh, that on on our web channels. Mm -hmm. Um. Another thing that I'm excited about is I'm going to Montreal in March um, to work with uh, artists and AI. We, it's called the AI Art Lab. So we're working um, with artists and AI to create like new audiovisual performances. Cool. Um, that's something that we actually did in Japan as well mm -hmm. in November. Mm -hmm. So uh, last year at the festival, you could see some of the results. We had a few performances of artists working with AI and music at the time. Um, so this is kind of the next edition of that. Wow, so that sounds quite, really interesting. Quite exciting. Oh, I'll keep an eye out for that. That yeah. sounds really cool. Yeah. Excellent. So there's lots to do. And even if you're watching this or listening to this after <laughs> uh, February 2020, there will always be other events to check out in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's also the global network. So if you happen to be in Barcelona in March, for example, mm -hmm. or in Montreal in August, or in Buenos Aires in September, there's like um, other things going on right. there as well. So. And the experience will be kind of tailored to that individual city exactly. as well. Exactly. So, so another it's... reason to travel. Too. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much no, for your time. You this was a really much. fun discussion. Yeah. I learned a lot and I That's look great. forward to attending one of your events. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Non-Native Creative. If you liked this episode, please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Feel free to leave comments about this episode in the comment section too. 
Please make sure to stop by the project Patreon at patreon.com slash nonnativecreative. Patrons can get access to Patreon-only discussions, bonus behind-the-scenes media, interview transcripts, and access to patron-only live streams. Your support will help make sure the series can continue to share exciting, interesting stories from creative people working across borders. Thanks again for watching. See you next week.